introduce the seminar speaker, but I have one introduction to make. Can you stand up? This is Usman Aslam, who is uh, here from Pakistan for six months, a PhD student at the University of Agriculture in Faisalabad. And uh, so if you see him around, that's Usman. Thank you. Thank you. And I am introducing today's seminar speaker. My name is Greg Kilka. I work do research and extension with nematodes, one floor up. And today's speaker is Evie Wellson, and she's making it easy on me. She's going to introduce herself mostly. And so all I have to remember to say is she's a PhD student, right, in my program. And <laughs> I seem to recall you showed up June of last year, June of 2017. And this is her proposal seminar. Did I do okay? <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Evie, and today I'm going to talk to you about what I'm working on as the studies on chemical ecology of plant parasitic nematodes with an eye towards management. To start off, I'll do a little introduction about me. My full first name is Elizabeth, but I do shorten it down to Evie because it's unique and not many people know Evie's. I grew up in Williamsburg, Virginia for most of my life. And here we have the Jamestown Settlement, which is when the British came over and this was the first place they landed. There's also Colonial Williamsburg, which was one of the first capitals of the 13 colonies. There are battlefields in Yorktown, which is where a lot of the wars were fought. And you can go climbing around in all the trenches and you can see all the different cannons and everything there. It's quite fun. And lastly, what I miss the most about Virginia are the beaches and the fresh seafood that I can get there. So when I was a junior in high school, my family moved, oh. So more about Virginia. When I lived there, I never really thought about the crops that were being, that were being grown. But surrounding the area, there's a lot of corn fields. There are cotton fields, which are my favorite, because it's like snow in the middle of summer, and it's super warm as well as a lot of tobacco fields. But recently these tobacco fields have been changing over to soybeans because tobacco isn't really as popular there anymore. So my junior year of high school, my family moved from Williamsburg to Ames, Iowa, and I finished up high school up at Gilbert, which is two miles just north of here. And here I got to experience moving to a town that would, had an institution in it, a research institution. And that was much different from where I was because Nothing was really there besides historical stuff. I also got to experience that I had to go outside in three feet of snow and nothing was ever closed down, which was very different for me, as well as digging myself out of ditches. And my parents only know about one of these incidences. <laughs> so don't bring up the other ones to them. <laughs> so how did I get to Iowa State for college? Well, since I was so close to here and my family, I ended up doing my undergrad here, and I started off in chemical engineering. And for my first two years, I was researching nerve regeneration. And in the lab, we would test different polymers that were rolled into tubes, and then we would insert them into rats who had severed nerves, and we would see how the conduits would encourage the nerve growth back together so that if someone had a spinal injury, we could probably use one of these so that they could regain movement of their limbs. I didn't really like engineering, and so I ended up switching to biochemistry and found my way to the Seed Science Center, where I was working with Gary Monkfold. And I knew I wanted to work with stuff that was sick, and then I could go ahead and make it better again and study that. And so I started learning about plant pathology. And here I worked with sudden death syndrome, um, a little bit of pythium on corn, as well as tomato mosaic virus with tomatoes. And so after my junior year, I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to go to grad school. I'll just go get a random job. And so I ended up doing a quality control job in the summer and found out I hated doing the same thing every single day for three months. So I came back for my senior year, and I walked in there, and I told Derek, who is one of the researchers there, that I wanted to go to grad school for plant pathology. He got me in contact with Dye, and I started learning more about plant pathology. <laughs> and I finally graduated and did an eight-month co-op with DuPont Pioneer in the diagnostics lab, just to make sure I really liked plant pathology and I wanted to stay in it. I ended up staying in it since I'm here. <laughs> and so I applied for Iowa State and a few other southern schools that don't have snow. 
<laughs> I made my way back to Iowa State studying nematology. So the first nematode and the primary nematode I'm going to be working with is soybean cyst nematode, I'll refer it as SEN, and this is caused by heterodera glycines. It was first introduced into the United States in 1954 when ornamental plants were shipped here from Japan with infested soil. Since then, we can see that SEN has spread rapidly throughout the United States. And it's important for us to know where SEN is located because that way we can communicate with the farmers to help them manage the populations in their fields. For the life cycle of SEN, they start off as eggs in the soil and then they will hatch as second stage juveniles. And this is the portion of the life cycle where management is most implemented because it's the weakest part of the life cycle. The juveniles hatch and they're trying to, to migrate around and find a soybean root. And when they find one, they will enter the root and establish a feeding site. After maturing and eating, they will either become a female or an adult. And here you can see that females and or females or males. <laughs> females and males are very different in size and characteristics. The females will remain in the root and will swell so much that they will rupture through the tissue and will be exposed into the soil. The males will return to a worm or vermiform shape and will exit the root to mate with the females. Once the females are mated with, they will deposit a gelatinous matrix filled with eggs into the soil. These eggs will then hatch and infect more soybeans and the life cycle will go on about four to six times in one growing season. While the other eggs are hatching, the females will die and turn into a thick-walled leathery cyst that's filled with, with dormant but viable eggs. And throughout this time, the cysts or the eggs in the cysts will hatch in different years and infect soybeans when they're planted. And this makes it very difficult to control because the cysts can last in the soil for up to 10 years. So right now farmers are doing a corn-soybean rotation with soybeans the first year, then two years of corn, and then on the fourth year, year they will plant soybeans again. But the cysts are still present, so they can still get infected with SEN. For the first portion of my talk, I'm going to talk about the juvenile section of the life cycle. So these are the ones that have just hatched and they're in the soil trying to find a soybean root. To study the movement of the, the juveniles, I use a basic chemotaxis chip. And on the edge of everyone's tables on the right side, I place an example of one of the chips. You can take it out and look at it, but don't pull it apart, because I actually have to use these tomorrow for one of my tests. <laughs> so the chip has four individual lanes, and I can test up to three treatments on one chip. And that is because I'm leaving one randomly selected lane to be water water, and this will tell me if the chip is level and can be trusted with the other treatments that are tested in there. And if you can't see the chip, I put a quarter up here to tell you how small it really is. To zoom in on one of these lanes, <coughs> I first place the nematodes, about 40 juvenile nematodes, into the center entry port. And on the very outer edges, I put a treatment on one side and a water neutral on the other side. The treatments are allowed to slowly diffuse towards the nematodes using microfluidic filters. And from there, the nematodes can choose to move from the center, the center entry point to resting chambers that are either closer to the treatment that I'm testing, or they can move away from the treatment that I'm testing. <coughs> so for a mock setup that I have, I have one treatment on the left side compared to a water, and then I placed nematodes in the middle. I then allow the nematodes to move towards the treatment if they choose to for 24 hours, and then I count the number of nematodes that are on the left side, the middle, and the right. Here, I take the number of nematodes in total population that's in the lane. So the design for this chip right now is that it is a chamber that is completely filled with liquid. And this isn't very characteristic for plant parasitic nematodes because they are located in the soil. 
So there's a bunch of soil particles around, and they're using the small films of water around these soil particles to move. And to make it more characteristic of soil, we are collaborating with a lab, Nemometrics, that's out of the state of Oregon. And it was first started by Sean Lockery, a professor at University of Oregon. And he studies a lot of C. elegans. And what he's done is they have placed columns into these resting areas for the nematodes. There's little like circular columns in there. And this can allow us to change the diameter as well as the spacing between these columns to mimic different soil textures. And this will allow the nematodes to be in a more characteristic soil environment. And the reason why we're doing this is because I hypothesize that it will change the behavior of the juveniles. So previously, we have been testing different treatments in the basic chemotaxis chip, and we have some treatments that are labeled as attractants and repellents. And I'm not saying that by inserting these columns that an attractant is gonna become a repellent. I'm more focusing on the treatments that have been labeled as neutrals. Maybe the nematodes did not have enough to push off of, and they had to use so much energy that they couldn't actually become a, an attractive or a repellent. So these columns would assist the, the juveniles while they're trying to move around. For my next portion, I'm still gonna be talking about SEN juveniles, the ones that just hatched from their eggs. So right now, I'm working with Chelsea Harbach in my lab collaboratively to look at the claims that companies have that cover crops can be used as trap crops for SEN. Let's first define what a trap crop is. That is when we have a root in the soil and there's nematodes. They will be attracted to the roots and they will enter the roots. But since SEN can only feed off of soybeans, they then find out that it's not a soybean and they cannot establish a successful feeding site, and they die. Companies are claiming that their cover crops can be used to control nematodes, reduce populations, as well as act as these trap crops. And so for example, a company with different grass and radish mixes specifically says that they can reduce soybean cis nematode populations. Another tillage root match, which Root Max, which is a grass, says that it can significantly reduce SEN populations. A tillage radish has said to control nematodes as well as suppress the pesky nematodes. For two different mustard lines, they say that they can suppress soil-borne fun soil fungi pathogens as well as nematodes. And lastly, my absolute favorite, is that European studies have shown that they can eradicate heterodere species completely. Heterodere species, or specifically soybean cis nematode, is not located in Europe, so how would they be able to say that it can 100% eradicate it if it was never present? <laughs> so to study the reaction of the juveniles to these cover crops, Chelsea and I are collecting root exudates. And root exudates are chemicals and different compounds that are secreted by the roots into the soil. And this will attract nematodes, fungi, and bacteria, and other different organisms that are located there. And so my questions are for the root exudates. Are the SENs, SEN juveniles attracted to the root exudates, which would verify the which would support the companies saying that their cover crops can be used as trap crops because they first need to attract the nematodes towards the roots so they can want to enter the roots to potentially start feeding. Or are the SCN juveniles repelled by the root exudates? And some of the root exudates might not do anything. They might not be attracted or they might not be repelled. So for our treatment sets, we are using eight species of just a general representation of a cover crop. The second group is nine species of broadleaf cover crops, which is like clovers. And the third group is six species of cereals or grass cover crops. And within each of these treatment sets, we are using a neutral control of fallow, which is soil with no plant in it as well as a Rutgers tomato, which is a neutral 
attract or not a, a attractant or not a repellent for SEN juveniles. <clears throat> and for the chemotaxis chemical controls, I'm using potassium nitrate as an attractant and calcium chloride as a repellent. And you might be thinking, well, if I'm working with SEN, why am I not using soybean root exudates? And that is because soybeans does not have a consistent attractant result for this SEN juveniles. And Augie Beeman, a previous graduate student, showed that potassium nitrate does have a consistent attractant when we're doing chemotaxis. And so here is an individual well that was scanned four different times. So the top portion is the initial position of the nematodes when they were placed into the chemotaxis chip. And then at 4, 8, and 24 hours, he clicked on the nematodes and saw that there was an attractant towards the potassium nitrate. And that's the red dots that are in there. And I've also shown what the nematodes look like in a resting chamber. Another method I will be using to test the, uh, the root exudates is a scanner movement analysis. And this is when I place 20 nematodes into each of the wells in the, of the 24 well plate. And then I place the root exudate on top of them so that the SEN juveniles are submerged in the root exudate. Then for every hour of, 20, of a 24 hour period, each individual well is scanned. From there, I can take the images that were taken from there put it into a program, and then click on each individual nematode for that 24 hour period to see how their movement has changed. And using some of the videos and the data that Jared Jensen made when he was here, is the, this is gonna be the initial position of the nematodes when they are exposed to abamectin of a concentration of zero milligrams per liter. So this is just the solvent that abamectin was dissolved in. The initial position is gonna be the green circles. If the nematode has moved, it will be blue, and if it did not move, it will be red. So you can see most of the nematodes are remaining blue, meaning that they are not affected by the solvent. And again, if we increase the abamectin concentration to 10 milligrams per liter, we have another video, and the green is the initial position of the nematodes. Blue will be if it moved, and red will be if it did not move. And most of them are red, showing that the movement has been reduced. From there, we can take the positions and the percent movement of the nematodes and graph it over the 24 hour period. So the two lowest concentrations of abamectin are the top two lines, and you can see that the percent movement was higher than the three higher concentrations of abamectin. For my preliminary results of the chemotaxis chips I have for broadleaf, there are two different cultivars we are using for daikon type radish. And the enricher cultivar was seen as an attractant and the tillage radish was seen as a repellent. Also for oilseed radish, the cultivar image was seen as an attractant. And then I have the chemical controls that I'm using, potassium nitrate and calcium chloride, which were the attractant and repellent respectively. And so the results of it being an attractant supports the claims that the companies have that these cover crops can be used as trap crops because they first need to, and then the nematodes will enter, but we'll find out it's not a soybean, so they can't feed and they will die. For this next portion, I'm still gonna be talking about SEN, but I'm going to focus on the male and female interactions. My questions for this portion of the life cycle do males have an age preference for females? Do younger, middle-aged, or older males prefer younger, middle-aged, or older females? As well as, what are the males attracted to? 
We know that the females are secreting a sex pheromone that is attracting the males. But are, are the males only attracted to the sex pheromone, or are they also attracted to the gelatinous matrix that the females are depositing? To study this, we have a root with a juvenile feeding on the inside. It will either exit the root as a male, or it will remain in the root and swell so much that it, that it is exposed into the soil, and that's the female. So from here, the, the males are using the thin films of water around particles to migrate towards the females to mate. So I had to come up with a way to remove this environment. And to do that, I placed the infected roots into a hydroponic environment. So now when the males leave the root, they are more dense than the water that I have in there, and they will fall to the bottom of my container. And that results in non-mated males and non-mated females. For this experiment setup, I plant two susceptible soybeans in naturally infested SCN soil. And they are placed into a temperature-controlled water bath that is held at 27 degrees Celsius. And this is the ideal temperature for SCN. After eight days, I remove the soybeans from the soil and I completely wash the roots of all of the soil because the nematodes are all going to be feeding on the inside. From there, I take the washed soybeans and place them into a hydroponics flask so that the roots are always submerged in water. To collect non-mated males, they will fall down the tube into another tube with a flask on it, or with a clip on it. And that's this portion of that cartoon. They're falling down. And this will allow me to put them into a separate container and test them. You can also see that the flask is covered in aluminum foil. And that is to keep the roots and the nematodes in a dark environment that they usually are in. Because the sun doesn't get in the soil. For the non-mated females, they will start to rupture through the root at 14 days after that initial planting. At 16 days, you can see that they're a bit larger. And finally, at 18 days, the gelatinous matrix is starting to be deposited by the females into the soil. And so this can either be kept on the, on the females when I test them, or I can separately remove the gelatinous matrix to test if the males are attracted to them. For the chemotaxis setup, I will place females on one side of the chip compared to a water neutral, and the males will go in the middle, the center entry point. From here, I will allow the males, which I am assuming they're gonna to go towards the females since they want to mate with them, and the chip will be counted at 24, 36, and 72 hours. To use as a natural positive control, I will be using vanillic acid, which was published by Jaffe in 1989 as the sex pheromone that is being secreted by the females. Now, don't be alarmed. The Tilka Lab can work on more than just SEN. So the next nematode I plan on talking about is root knot nematode, caused by a Meloidogynes species. Root knot nematode is the most important plant parasitic nematode across the world, and it has a very wide host range. The most common Meloidogyne species that we think of is Incognita, but Hapla is here in Iowa. So I will be planning on working with Meloidogyne Incognita as well as Meloidogyne Hapla. For the root knot nematode life cycle, they start off as eggs in the soil and hatch as second stage juveniles. From here, the juveniles will migrate towards the root tip of a susceptible host. And the reason why they're going towards the root tip is because root knot nematode is not as strong as SCN. And they want to go to a softer area because they're trying to go around the plant or around the root cells. It has to be a lot more flexible and squishier. From there, the juveniles will establish a feeding site 
and they will mature into either a male or a female. The females will be fertilized and will form, will, will be in the galls of the root and will deposit the egg mass on the outside of the root. And so the root will look kind of shiny and that's the egg mass that's there. Now the galls are not from the female swelling. When the nematodes go into the root, they cause a hormone imbalance in the root. So it causes uh, the growing of cells as well as a lot of multiplication of the cells. And that's what the galls are. For this first portion, I'm going to focus on the juvenile, like juvenile section of the life cycle. For these, I will be studying the chemotaxis for different treatments, as well as placing them on the scanner to see the effects of different treatments for their movement. The treatments I will be using are seed treatments, which are available on the market for growers to use. The top three were previously tested by Augie and Jared with SEN. And so I plan on testing the top three with root knot nematode, as well as two new products that are available on the, on the market, Aveo as well as Nemistrike, and then True Nemco is a new one that hasn't been released yet, but it's still, it's still there. I'm going to stay out of all the merging of the, the companies because they're making it more complicated. <laughs> to test these treated seed, I'm going to collect seed exudates as well as radical exudates. So to collect the seed exudates, I will place the treated seed into water and let them sit for an hour and then use that as a treatment. And for the radical exudates, I will germinate the treated seed and then only place the radicals into the water to collect those radical exudates. Augie showed with the seed exudates in SEN juveniles that Alevo significantly reduced the percent movement of the SEN juveniles. But with the radical exudates, he saw that there was no effect of the SEN percent movement. But root knot nematode is so different than SEN that might as well still try it because we might see something. For this next portion, I'm going to focus on the male and female like the male and female interaction in the life cycle. And so males and females are present and sexual reproduction does happen, but females can undergo parthenogenesis. And this is the production of eggs without the use of a male. And so to collect the males and the females, it's very similar to the SEN. I'll have an infected root and the males will either leave the root and enter the soil, or the females will stay in the root and will swell. And to remove the soil portion, I will place them into a hydroponics environment. So now when the males leave the root, they are more dense than the water, and they will fall to the bottom of the container, leaving me with non-mated males and non-mated females. Now, if I see that there is an egg mass present on the root, then I know that the females have undergone parthenogenesis. So if there's, there is no egg mass, then the female has not undergone parthenogenesis yet. For the male collection, they will fall to the bottom of the hydroponic flask that I'm using. So that's this portion. And my questions for the male and female interaction, are males attracted to females? And this seems like a pretty basic question to ask. But there is no literature out there saying that males are actually attracted to the females. So this would be something I would have to verify. As well as, if they do attract, what is attracting the males? Are the females secreting the sex pheromone like SEN females are? Or are they secreting something else that is attracting the males towards them? Is there an age preference for the males? So are different aged males attracted to different aged females? And another one is, will males be attracted to females that have undergone parthenogenesis or are in the process of undergoing parthenogenesis? 
And another thing that I could do, is, since I'm working with two different species of Moleda guy, is to see the attraction of Moleda guy and Hapla to Moleda guy and Hapla males to incognita females and vice versa. Because then I could look at how interspecies relations are going. For this, I will be using the chemotaxis chip, and I will place females on one side of the chip with water on the opposite side, and the males in the middle. I will allow the males to move towards the females, and I will count this at 24, 36, and 72 hours. But for a positive control, we don't know what it is, because we don't know what is attracting the males. And so for SEN, I was using vanillic acid, so I'm going to test that out with root knot nematode to see if it is just a general attractant for male nematodes. Now the third and fourth nematode I'm going to talk about is something I hope to get to if resources and time permit me to. And this is reniform nematode caused by rotilanculus reniformis. And it is very sim it's similar to root knot and SEN because it swells. But the thing about this nematode is that all stages occur in the soil. So the eggs are located in the soil. They will hatch and mature through the juvenile stages and become a female or an adult. And during that time, they are not feeding at all. The infective stage of this nematode is the female. And so once they are adult females, they will enter the root establish a feeding site, and then will swell to be exposed into the soil. Here is when the males will go and mate with them, and then eggs will be produced. This nematode is more important in the southern U.S. than soybeans. Important in the southern U.S. on soybeans than SEN. So it would be very important to understand how this nematode is working and affecting the soybeans. If I wanted to work with this nematode in Iowa, I would have to get a permit, so that's something we would have to talk about. <laughs> and the fourth nematode is root lesion nematode, caused by Pratolinchus penetrans. And talking to a professor in Wisconsin, she provides free SEN testing for farmers in Wisconsin. And so she will count the number of nematodes to see the population in their fields. And on top of that, she also counts the amount of plant parasitic nematodes that are in the soil samples that are sent to her. And she is seeing that root lesion nematode is becoming very problematic on soybeans. So it would be very important to study this nematode and its effect on soybeans. And what this nematode does is it will enter the root and will start eating the cells and causes necrosis of the roots that form these lesions. That's what all those brown spots on there are. And for this life cycle, it can happen simultaneously in the root and in the soil. And so if eggs are, are hatching in the root, they will mature, or they will hatch and mature, and so then they can go ahead and stay in the roots while they're feeding, or at any time they can come out of the roots, enter a different root, or stay in the soil their entire time. They kind of just get to do whatever they want. And also, this nematode does not swell, so it'll be a, a bit different for me to collect these because I can't just throw them onto a sieve and have the bigger ones get caught. I will have to collect the eggs and hatch them up, and then I can work with different stages of the life cycle. For reniform and root lesion nematode, I plan on studying the, uh, the effects of the seed treatments using the chemotaxis chip as well as the scanner method to see how the movement of the nematodes are affected when they are exposed to the seed treatment. And so for now, my four, what is attracting them and what do the males prefer for the females? And lastly, is the effects of seed treatments for root knot, reniform, and root lesion juvenile nematodes to see how they are affected by the seed treatments that are available on the market. Thank you everyone for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? I was wondering how you interpret the results of the scanner method. Is it a 
large amount potentially onto the nematode. If they don't move, is it toxic or is it no longer not a chemotactic because they're so happy because they're bathing in it? Um, it's not so that we're trying to see if it's an attractant. It's we're trying to see. Well, okay. The question is. <laughs> Wait, can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> in your scanner method, when you apply a certain concentration and they don't move, is it because it's toxic or because they don't want to move because they're happy they they have it there? Yeah. So the question is, when I put them into the scanner, is the uh, Treatments that I'm putting on there causing them to be so happy that they're just going to not move anymore, or if it's toxic to them. Well, because chemotaxis means moving toward a chemical yeah. and they're in it. Yeah. So for the scanner, we're more trying to see if it's causing them to stop moving, so it will be toxic, or if it's not affecting them at all. And so you can see in the results that I had that a lot of the time they started off with a lot of movement up top and then they kind of went down, but it flattened out. <clears throat> and so if nematodes don't really get what they want and they don't find a food source, they get really lazy. And so if they start to go down and flatten out, we know that it's not really doing anything for them. But if at the beginning they start to flatten out and it's really low percent movement, then we can say that movement is affected because it's causing them to not want to move anymore. Does that answer your question? So in the, in, the, in the scanner, we're not really trying to see if it's an attractant or repellent. We're just seeing how the treatment is affecting their movement. But in the chemotaxis chip, that's where we're seeing if it's attracting them to go towards it or causing it to go away. Okay. Yeah. So, you're, so you're not asking the chemotaxis question here? No, not in the scanner, only in the chip. Why are you using radicals instead of all the secondary roots, just all roots in general? Wouldn't you expect the nematodes to affect those more likely than just the radicals? So the question is, why am I only using the radicals and not the rest of the other roots that are coming off? And that's because the <coughs> purpose of seed treatments is mostly to protect like the initial germination of the seeds so that the plants can go ahead and establish themselves. So. Most companies are looking to see how the seed treatment is going to initially protect the seed while it's trying to germinate. So that's why we're collecting the radicals. And the chemicals that are used in the seed treatments, a lot of time they will break down in the soil quicker so they won't spread out and not survive, but they won't be there when more roots are starting to form. Um, for your um, ribbon nematode experiments, I think, um, you said you were going to try using phen phenolic yeah, acid yeah. control. If that does not work, do you have any reason to believe that it might not work? And do you have any ideas on what other controls yeah. you could use that doesn't? So the question is, with root knot nematode, I'm using vanillic acid, and do I expect it to work, or what am I going to do if it doesn't work? So we honestly don't know. Um, I don't know, that's why I'm testing it. And so the general question is, oh, if vanillic acid works for SEN, why not check to see if it's going to work for root knot nematode as well? Then if it doesn't, I'll probably go to plan B and try to figure out <laughs> what other things are going to attract the males. And maybe try to figure out what the sex pheromone, if there is one for root knot nematode females, is. But yeah, that's kind of just like, oh, I have this, so why not try it? <laughs> yeah. I hear you say early on in the <clears throat> seminar that soybean roots are not attracted to SEM. Yeah. So the question is, if I said that soybean roots are not attracted for SEM, it in these experiments when we were collecting root exudates of soybeans, they did not consistently attract the SEN juveniles. So it was kind of hard to use that as a, a positive or an attracting control because sometimes it would attract the SEN juveniles, but other times it didn't do anything. And so using potassium nitrate has a consistent attractant during these experiments. Do you have any theory as to why when you think, okay, SEN, soybean, there must be some kind of a attraction, right? Because it's really it's a good, I mean, it's a tough parasite, so. Why in your system did you see that? Do you have any theories? I think it might be because um, 
the SCN or the root entities aren't in the soil at this time. So it could be that there's so much water there that maybe some chemicals are separating and they're not interacting with the juveniles like they would be in the soil. And it's kind of like with hatching, we use uh, zinc sulfate. And so in water, zinc sulfate separates into zinc and the uh, sulfate. <laughs> zinc sulfate. <laughs> and so that is what helps to make the, the eggs more permeable so they can hatch more. But when you put zinc sulfate into the soil, it doesn't do anything to the eggs. It doesn't, it doesn't enhance hatching at all. So I think it's more so how the chemicals are interacting in the soil rather than in water. That's a problem we had all the way back to the days of Dirk Charlson. I don't know if you remember Dirk Charlson. Um, just really inconsistent results with soybean root exudates. So compared to being able to get a bottle of can of three or CHCl2 and make a solution, it's just really convenient to have artificial attractants and repellents. Is there any difference between the soybean lines you tried? Yeah, so there are, is, is there any difference between soybean lines? And there are varieties that are resistant to SEN. The problem with this is that PI88788 has been used for so long that the resistance is starting to break down. And so there is picking that people are coming out with, but it's kind of like telling farmers to apply the same fungicide for like 20 years. You wouldn't tell them to do that because there'd be resistance. And, or the resistance would be overcome by the, the pest. And so right now it kind of depends on what the companies, what varieties the companies are using, and which seed treatments they're putting onto it. I mean, clarify. When you're testing to see if they retract to the root exudates, did you try the susceptible lines of soybean, or were they all the same susceptible so, line? Um, I haven't worked with the soybean root exudates at all, but previous grad students have. There's another variety, or another version of the chip that instead of having four independent like uh, treatment lanes, it's a root chip, so it's one continuous lane on the side. And so they grew different varieties to like a susceptible variety and saw that, I mean, they're obviously gonna go towards a susceptible, but that chip's still kind of in the process of being uh, enhanced or? Well, it's, it's limited to the radical, and once it's that long, it's grown out of the chip. So it only gives us about two days worth of data. But it's not, SCN's not, it's not black and white. Nothing with the nematode is black and white. So you might get 50 nematodes going to a susceptible root and 43 towards a resistant root, and other times it'll be the same number. There's not overwhelming evidence that they know they're going to a resistant or a susceptible. It, it it's, seems to be pretty random. Other questions? I'm just looking at her, actually. <laughs> <laughs> questions, comments? Next question. About the fungicides you are going to use, what, what is the mode of action of those? The, uh, the salt treatments. Yeah. Oh, the, so what are the different modes of action for the different seed treatments? Um, I don't think any of them are systemic. They're all just stay on the outside, and then they're supposed to just kind of go around where the root is. Uh, that will like attach to the nematodes and will kill them. Um, some of them are like kind of the same for fungicides. They will uh, cause like proteins not to be able to form. And that's all I can think of right now. So there's nine different seed treatments and each one has a different mode of action. But I think there's only one that's systemic, which goes back to the question about why not study more of the roots? Well, well we're limited by what we can study in the lab, but also it just, the companies say they move, the treatments move in the soil to protect the early part of the season, the roots in the early part of the season. So we've just done radical exudates because that's all we've been able to get our arms around. But we could maybe use like your hydroponics tube where you collect mammals, we could collect exudates from a larger amount of roots for sure. Any other questions?
If not, let's thank EB again. Thank you.